Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the Sounds True Foundation. The goal of the Sounds True Foundation is to provide access and eliminate financial barriers to transformational education and resources, such as teachings and trainings on mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion. If you'd like to learn more and join with us in our efforts, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today is a rebroadcast from Sounds True's Walking Together series. Walking Together is a collection of freely available teachings on standing in solidarity with Black, Indigenous, people of color to help heal collective trauma, provide resources for personal growth, and unravel the grip of racism on our culture. You can learn more by visiting resources.soundstrue.com backslash walking dash together. It's a long one here. One more time. Resources.soundstrue.com backslash walking dash together. And now a special session from Walking Together with Bio Akamalafe. In this session, we have a super special guest, a new friend of mine, someone whom I find tremendously heart opening and I would say kind of mind shattering. Someone who, in my experience, has opened my mind to new ways of looking at things. His name is Bio Akumalafe, and he's from Nigeria, living now in India with his wife and two children. And he's going to be talking about letting us make sanctuary. Let us make sanctuary. Just a little bit more about Bio. He's a speaker, teacher, author, and public intellectual. He refers to himself as a renegade academic. He is globally recognized for his poetic, unconventional, and I would say soul stirring and healing views on our global crisis and social change. He's the author of two books, We Will Tell Our Own Story and These Wilds Beyond Our Fences, Letters to My Daughter on Humanity's Search for Home. He's the executive director of the Emergence Network, and he's host of the course, We Will Dance with Mountains, which begins on October 18th. And now, let us make sanctuary with bio. I'm turning it over to you, brother. Thank you, sister. Thank you, and it's great to be here. Um, I felt I would start by um, first acknowledging the uh, how indebted I am to um, my family for making this possible, for allowing me to come up here and say the words that I want to say. So thank you to Alethea, to Kea, to Ijeoma. Um, and thank you to you, Tammy, for inviting me uh, to this and for everyone at Sounds True for making this possible. Um, but indebtedness goes beyond that. Um, I also want to acknowledge my mother and my mother's mother and my ancestors, <laughs> you know, and the grounds that are undergoing some kind of seismic shift at the moment, allowing us to say the things that we can say, um, allowing the unsaid to be spoken and intelligible. Let me start, you know, what I feel led to say and to share um, by saying these words that I'm quite known for, um, which my wife rolls her eyes when she hears it over and over again, because I say it too much, a tad bit too much. Um, the times are urgent, let us slow down. The times are urgent, let us slow down. The times are urgent, let us slow down. Um, I'm always at pains to explain what I mean, what I mean by that, because when people hear me, they feel, huh, that's good advice. Um, I'll take a break this weekend, or I'll do more yoga, 
or I'll say more prayers just before I get to the desk or something like that. And I like to explain to people that it's not quite the same as taking a break. Um, there's something more about this. And I'll try to explain that with a story. I'll start with a story. Um, and then it will lead me hopefully all the way to what I mean by the invitation, let us make sanctuary. Why this is prophetic, why this is um, feminist, why this is uh, derived from indigenous wisdoms, why this is geometaphysical, why this is um, a powerful um, invitation, especially in our pandemic inflected moments. So um, I, I need a call and response dynamic here, Tammy, you would have to do. So um, <laughs> I'm going to invite you to unmute your mic and then I'll say hello and then you say hello. It's a Yoruba thing, you see, um, a way of starting a story, like a ritual of getting everyone prepared for the story. And even though this story is going to be rushed through and brief, uh, I still want us to do it. Can we do it together? Okay. Let us slow down. I am with you. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so I say hello, and then you say hello. Okay, you're bringing it down, I'm taking it up. Or oh, I'm taking it up, you're bringing it down, like taking off and landing, okay? Hello, and there you go. Hello. Excellent. <laughs> you have to do it three times. Hello. 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 Excellent. You're in. <laughs> All right. So, um, there's a story about libations that I want to share, and I think it might help us understand what it means to slow down and what sanctuary invites us to be or to do at this time. Um, when I was growing up, I used to see my father, and I've told this story many, many times. I used to watch my father pour a libation, uh, maybe with his friends or elders, you know, just pour wine to the ground. And I would say to myself, what a perfectly good of all waste of wine. Why do this? What does this mean? It wasn't until I started on my decolonial journeys that I started to understand the deep cultural and uh, translocal stories, especially unique to Africans, uh, the African spiritual technologies that are cloaked in the seemingly ordinary ritual of just pouring drink to earth. And then I learned this story from, um, it's supposed to be from the place we call Egypt today, um, but was once called Kemet, the ancient name for Egypt. Um, in ancient Kemet, which was a civilization in its own right, the god Ra is speaking and sleeping and, and blustering and drunk, you know, at the side of the street. Um, and people would walk by Ra and make fun of him. Young, old, everyone, men, women, children, they would just point at Ra and mock him. What kind of a God are you to debase yourself like so? You know? And Ra would get angry and storm his way back to heaven. And on one of those trips, he was so furious, throw, uh, throwing a tantrum that he called his... Um, daughter who also happens to be his wife who also happens to be his mother don't ask me how all of this is so but um hathor is the name of his wife mother child and uh, hathor is like what's wrong dad and uh um ra says well i'm tired of men i'm tired of people i'm tired of human beings i like to get rid of them they make fun of me no one is worshiping me the, the way they used to. So Hathor promises she would do the job. And so like a hitman, she goes down to earth and her job is to leave no stone unturned, to devastate everything, to decapitate humanity. Um, she heads down and she starts to do her work. Only the problem is she does it too well. She kills people, she tears them limb from limb and she leaves um, uh, puddles of blood, you know, in her wake, which she would quickly drink up and then she would call it a day. And then the next day she would go through that same bloodied cycle of eating people and throwing their remains on the streets, their bones and licking up their blood. Such a terrible thing to behold. And no one could do anything about it. Even Ra, 
because you see Ra peer down from heaven. And I was like, no, 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 no. This isn't exactly what I had in mind. This is taking it too far. So Hathor come back home. My anger is appeased. But you know, she wouldn't let up. She would not stop. So Ra is confused. All of humanity is confused. No one knows what to do. Well, the long and short of the story is that Ra has to come down from heaven. And all the gods, I think two other gods, I can't quite remember their names, gather. And they hatch a plan, like a heist, a conceptual heist, if you will. And they say, maybe what we have to do is to trick Hathor. So what we'll do is to pour red wine on the ground and deceive Hathor into drinking that wine. Hopefully she sees the wine, she drinks it up, and then she forgets her operations or her directives, and then she goes away. And it happens exactly that way. So Hathor comes, she drinks the wine. She's at first bemused, she's confused. I thought I drank this yesterday night. And she laps it all up and she's drunk and she falls away. And so that idea of pouring drink to the earth, of um, deceiving the destruction or the destructive force has always been part of and parcel of African communities. Um, it's the idea of the libation. It's the idea that uh, in order to be safe, in order to be true, in order to live well and prosper, we must never forget that our stability is performed by remembering. Our stability is performed by a trick, by this trick that keeps Hathor at bay. And so this is the myth behind the libation and the, and the idea um, of um, pouring drink to earth that my father did. I'm not even sure he understood it this way, but it's now part and parcel of our everyday life, how we celebrate, how we give thanks, how we invoke the new, how we invoke um, the yet to come. Um, now, modernity has a story a myth that we are all safe, that we're all true, that we're all, um, that there is no problem at all. Uh, let me boil it down to three myths. There is one that says we're, we're stable, we're found, and that we're coherent. Those are the, one of the three uh, deceptions or delusions of modernity that um, we're indebted to nothing we need to give thanks for nothing. All we need to do is to look at each other and appease each other and worship each other's images. And there is nothing more to be done. So it's remarkably easy, you know, uh, for most of us born in sedentary civilization to forget how precarious things really are, you know, how lost we really are, how sustained we are by a trick. You know, we take it for granted that we're at home, that we're stable, that all we need to do is to keep progressing along these rationalistic techno-bureaucratic lines. All we need to do is to depend on our genius and then everything will be fine. You know, the future is out there. All we need to do is apply determination and we will get to it. So these are the ideas, you know, kind of packaged into this political theory called liberal humanism. We're free. We're free from debt. We're free from um, uh, entanglements. Uh, we're dissociated from the ground. We don't need to give honor to ancestors. We don't need to pay our uh, homage or have rites of passage. We don't need any of that because we're modern, we're free, we're sophisticated, we've arrived. Um, but once in a while, Tammy, once in a while, we're reminded how things fall apart. We're reminded in times when, like these times, like when a pandemic strikes and we don't know exactly know what to do. Uh, when the language with which we frame the future feels exhausted, outworn, you know, nothing makes sense anymore. Um, when cracks appear in the ground, you know, and then there's no walking forward anymore. There's no progress. Um, these times allow us the gift of noticing how indebted we are to the ground that we imagine we are left behind. And that's where the idea of slowing down in times of urgency comes from. The times are urgent, let us slow down. It doesn't mean reducing one speed. 
like, let me take it easy this weekend. Let me do this. Let me do that. It doesn't mean slowing down in the same directions we're heading for, because eventually we'll head to, we'll reach those destinations, right? So it doesn't make any sense to slow down. Slowing down is more an issue of touching our indebtedness, touching the entangling threads, the tentacularities that connect us to the earth, that connect us to ancestry, that connect us to the more than human, the non-human, the yet to be human. You know, the idea that we are free gets in the way of freedom. The idea that we are complete, coherent, um, always intelligible, at heart rational, Puritan, th these are frames of whiteness. These are white tropes. Um, by whiteness, I don't mean white identified bodies. I mean um, an earth forming strategy that frames human selves as superior to all other kinds of bodies that suggests that we need not turn to understand where we come from, what we're indebted to. We need not turn to the world around us. We should only turn inwards. You know, we are self-sufficient, self-evident, self-propagating, self-correcting. There's nothing more to be had about that. Um, but at times of urgent let us slow down is the invocation of the modern human. It is standing at the crossroads, and maybe I should take a detour here and say that the Yoruba people have a philosophy, an indigenous cosmology that has at its center this idea of the crossroads, what they call the crossroads, what we call the crossroads. Um, the crossroads or the orita is where the trickster uh, sits. The trickster sits at the crossroads. The trickster's name in the Yoruba pantheon is called Eshu. An issue is the one that holds agency in his hands, agency or ashe, the way the world materializes. It materializes at intersections, at crossroads. Growing up, I heard stories about crossroads. I, uh, one of the most famous crossroads was the entrance into a market, into a marketplace. That was where spirits actually congregated. So um, we had this street urban legend that if you get to the marketplace and you bend down and you look between your legs and look back, you know, look at the world between your legs, you will actually find um, monstrous things. You know, you would find uh, three-headed beasts. You would find people that have died centuries ago. You would find things you're not supposed to see. You would see things you're not supposed to see. And you can only do that when you're at a crossroads, right? You're at the liminal edges of all things. Um, I never tried it, I wish I did, but every time I tried to do it, my uncle would, or my, anyone that was nearby would slap me upside the head and forbid me uh, from doing that. Um, the crossroads is where the idea of slowing down in terms of urgency actually gains its intelligibility because slowing down again is where temporalities, timelines, other ways of being in the world, other monstrous forms, you know, the gist of feminist scholarship is not male versus female. It's the idea that we are indeterminate and our bodies are much more diverse, more diffracted, much more spread out than the colonial forms that white modernity has fixed us into, right? That's the gist of uh, cutting edge feminist scholarship. It's not that this is against this. It's that we are not as contained as we think we are. We are crossroad species. We're mangled bodies. We fall into each other, right? We are containers for microbiomes, uh, just as much as we are containers for ancestral activisms, just as much as we are the activisms of trees and rhizomes and things around us, so that we are actually, in many senses, chimeric. We are, um, we are prolific. We are much more... Uh, in court than, uh, than we think we are, than modernity has pressed us into thinking we are. So the crossroads is the Yoruba people's way of making sense of that, that bodies intersect, intersect each other at crossroads. So the invitation to slow down at the crossroads is actually not an invitation that is framed for individuals to apply. Like Tammy said something wise the other day, I'm gonna apply it as a tool, you know, 
and take it as my new spiritual tactic, you know, to save myself, to become more woke, to become a better white ally. None of that. It's not about you. It's not about your individual trajectory to salvation. It's much more about lingering at the crossroads. And it's about the collective, the irreducibly collective, the manifold, the parliament of voices. It's a prayer, actually. When we say the times are urgent, let us slow down. It's a prayer to the more than human to create new kinds of bodies, okay? So, so that is the invitation here, that um, when I say the times are urgent, let us slow down, it is an invitation to masquerades, to tricksters, to the more than human, to make themselves known, to make themselves heard. It is an invitation for us to surrender to the more than human goings on around us. You know, not to so much ask the question, what do I do about racial justice? as it is to listen, to queer our bodies, and to come and approach the world in ways that we're not used to, okay? Um, and I should say here that sanctuary is where slowing down happens. Sanctuary is slowing down. Um, so that I can say, the times are urgent, let us make sanctuary. The times are urgent, let us go slowly down into sanctuary. The times are urgent, let us be slowed down by the beings that exceed us. The times are urgent, let us be defeated by things that we cannot understand. The times are urgent, let us diffract our ways of knowing. The times are urgent, let us be um, released from the traps of the things we already know. Uh, so these are the invocations. These are the more than human happenings that are attending this invitation to slow down. And like I said, it happens in sanctuary. I borrowed this idea of sanctuary from medieval practices. Um, I'm sure people might know that um, in uh, maybe 16th century England, um, the Catholic church borrowed from pagan, um, pagan sources this idea of making sanctuary or claiming sanctuary, actually, not making sanctuary, but claiming sanctuary. And the practices were like this. If you were accused of killing someone or hurting someone, you became a fugitive. You were chased until, um, I don't know, until they caught you. And if you were not caught, it was probably because you found sanctuary. Um, and to find sanctuary was to get to a sacred site like the church um, and hold an aspect of the church, maybe the pillar or the door knocker and claim sanctuary. Loudly say, I claim sanctuary and you were let into the sanctuary. And for a time, you were given some rest. It was a place of rest and peace. You were taken away from your captors and your captors were disallowed, not permitted to enter the premises of the sacred site. That practice kind of phased out in the 17th century. And then we started to have a different kind of juridical order, you know, lawyers and judges and all of that. But prior to that, we had sanctuary. And I like the idea of sanctuary. I like that in the flatness of the modern, there is a bump in the ground, so to speak, that there is a place that you can run to that kind of disturbs the flatness, the continuity, the perpetuity, of modernity. That is, there's a place where you cannot go, which is, a, which is something really hard for modern minds to hear. Because as modern citizens, we think we can go everywhere we want to. We, no place is too sacred to build a parking lot in. No mountain is too sacred to blast it and build four faces into it. You know, um, nothing is sacred in the modern because the sacred has been chased away. So the idea that there is a place where you cannot go a place you cannot plant your feet because it's sacred. It's, it's, you must approach it with deep hesitation. That is a beautiful idea to me. And so I started to look at that idea of sanctuary and think, well, what can we do with this idea today? And so I read the idea of sanctuary as making sanctuary because we no longer have sanctuaries in that sense. Of course, we have people who provide sanctuaries as places of safety. But the sanctuary I speak about is not about safety today. It's about shape shifting. It's about noticing ourselves as if for the first time. And let me explain what that means. 
I found that in the architecture of medieval sanctuaries, um, there was um, almost always a monstrous um, thing on their door. Maybe the, it was called a hagode. Or the door knocker was shaped in the preposterous form of a gargoyle or, or some beast or something like that. And I always wondered, why would uh, the church, uh, why would um, a sanctuary put such a repelling or repellent or irritating figure at the entrance of sanctuary? Wouldn't you want to put a cherub or an angelic form or something more inviting to help people feel they're safe? Why would you put a monstrous being um, in the front of a sanctuary? And I feel the way I read it is that sanctuaries are not meant for humans. They're meant for monsters. Um, sanctuaries are meant for beings that have lost their sense of intelligibility. Sanctuaries are meant for fugitives, fugitives from the human colonial order. That's the way I read it today. And let me see if I can explain that even further that the human, when we think about the human, we think about um, a bipedal structure, such as we are. But I feel the human is a colonial imperial order that says, this is the way to be, this is the form you must take, this is the gender you must assume, this is the identity you must assume, this is the way to be in the world. Um, the human is a colonial territory that decapitates trees that displaces other human bodies. And I say this from a very uh, deep sense of racialized or, or deep understanding of racialization, that there were people around the world that were not allowed access into that vaunted category of the human. They were deemed not quite human. Um, black bodies, brown bodies around the world were deemed, you know, you're not quite there yet. Uh, I don't want to go into craniology or eugenics or even the advent of um, confirmatory science, you know, um, and empiricism. It's the idea that there are some that are really human that have reached the rational heights, the transcendent heights of being human, and there are some who are not quite there yet. So the human is not just to be assumed. The human is a colonial order. And over time, historically, many people including women, have been denied access into that category. And now that category is dying. That category is besieged by pandemics, you know, by the Anthropocene, by the loss of climate stability. And now we don't know what to do. Now it's proliferating fugitives. And so those fugitives must ask themselves the question, where do we go? And I feel the way to go is not, you know, is not to find some kind of new manifesto and create a different order. We need to make sanctuary. That's what fugitives do. They either claim sanctuary or, or if sanctuary is not available, they make sanctuary. Like the fugitives that ran away from the plantations in the Americas and built their own fugitive societies and civilizations and sciences. We need a place of deep inquiry that is not about feeling safe. Again, it's not about just being safe for, for the time being, but it's about losing and investigating the shapes that we're becoming. It's about losing sense of our coherence. It's about losing a sense of mastery, which is what got us into the mess of the Anthropocene in the first place. But those of us who are listening who may not be familiar with the term Anthropocene, it describes the man-made order we're in that is connected to climate chaos today basically. That is the industrial world that we have given birth to has made it possible for us to gain a sense of mastery at the cost of losing our connections to ancestors, to land, to ecology, to the modern human, to the other than human. So we have a very sterilized sense of power. And that power is losing its powerfulness. So we need other places of power. And this is what the invitation, the times are urgent, let us slow down. You can see it's much deeper, much vaster, if you will, than just taking a break. It's more about investi investigating the bricks that are in our flesh, more than just taking a break. It's more about investigating how we can commune with the world around us. 
It's about investigating what it means to eat together. It's about investigating grief as activism, loss as a way of researching our entanglements with the world around us. You know, it's about, I would, I would probably even think of it as an onto-epistemological Sabbath. <laughs> Like, like a Sabbath, but not just a Sabbath that is once a week, but a Sabbath that has come into the world, ushered into the realm of things and disturbed the business as usual. A Sabbath that imposes itself on the business as usual and insists, you know, on rest. And a deeper kind of rest is what I speak about. So let us make sanctuary is my invitation. And it's not just me, it's... Uh, it's my elders, it's my mentors, it's, I feel, um, it's the invitation of the slave ship, which might be shocking to people who, who hear that. But I feel that the places that we have avoided, you know, the places that modernity has pathologized are the sanctuary sites. They are the libated grounds, they're the fertile grounds where we can actually make sanctuary. Uh, so I actually think of the slave ship as a place of contemplation as a site of reweaving our connections with grief and loss and trauma and tragedy. It's a way of pouring drink to earth and saying Hathor, do not come hither. It's a way of um, losing shape, losing our sense of being human. And it's there that I feel um, a different sense of freedom can emerge and maybe we can find wiser ways of educating our children. Maybe we can find wiser articulations of economics. Maybe we can find wiser spiritualities just by being in spaces of sanctuary. Yeah, I think I'll stop there. Well, you've said a lot, Bio, and I have uh, a, a lot of questions for you. Uh, just uh, one of the last things you said that this is the invitation of the slave ship. And mm. I, didn't, I didn't understand that, how this opportunity to embrace sanctuary, to be bewildered, to uh, mm. seek and listen in a new way. And yeah. you talked about uh, specifically how that relates to, uh, is that a, a sense of place where uh, slave, sh slave ships were? Or help me understand that. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a wide, um, I'm going to come in wide, if you will. Uh, I feel that the indigenous Yoruba cosmologies, and it's not unique to Yoruba people alone, but many indigenous cosmologies have a sense of excessiveness, the embarrassing excessiveness of things. Let me see if I could pull that down uh, from the abstract. Um, what are you? What am I? Modernity has a, an answer, a solution to that. Tammy is this. You tick this box, you tick this box, you tick this box. You are a conglomeration of given facts, and that is all there is to you. Um, that's it. You're given, you're stabilized, you're an identity, and, and you are intelligible as a result. Modernity is a way of rendering uh, the complexity of reality in intelligible bites. You know, so that it's digestible, right? Um, um, but indigenous, uh, indigenous cosmologies, the other than modern cosmologies, speak about us as spillages. That is, you're not quite as contained as you think you are. In fact, you sh you, we shouldn't even speak about human beings. We should speak about human becomings, right? So, so we are spilling. We're constantly losing cells. And I'm speaking about this in a modern abstract sense that biologically speaking, we're transcorporeal transactions with the environment. We're losing cells, we're gaining bacteria. We're constantly negotiating what we are, even beyond our conscious, uh, conscious uh, uh, awareness of that. Um, so in a sense, uh, modernity would look at the slave ship and say, this is a vessel of, of tragedy, right? We admit that this is something horrible that happened. But if we actually look through different lenses, we will find that many other cosmologies might say that that was a rite of passage. That was a ritual across the Atlantic 
That was a way for Eshu, the trickster god, to sail the Atlantic to become something else in the so-called new world. And that was a way for, you know, without dismissing the horrible, uh, the atrocious, horrible things that happened on slave ships and after the slave ship upon disembarkation, without dismissing or downplaying any of that, um, indigenous cosmologists will say that there was, that was that and, you know, it was horrible, but there were other things that were happening at the same time. So this is the theory of excess, that things spill. So emancipation, decolonial emancipation, is not, a, is not the work of struggling with what is. It's a place of occupying what we are becoming, right? Modernity is trying to stabilize us into boxes and says, you're good, you're evil, fight each other. You know, let's see who wins. But we're playing the game of modernity. What we are being invited to do is to occupy places of excess, places especially that have been pathologized, uh, demonized, or pushed away from view so that we all feel good, you know, pushed away out of view by this idea that we all should feel positive about ourselves. So the slave ship, I find, is a place of deep spiritual contemplation. It's a place to sit still, to sit within, to sit with and consider how are we all still in slave ships right now? You know, how is this still mattering today? You know, beyond the fact that this was just a historical thing that happened centuries ago, how are we still on board? How is it true that we, none of us disembarked? How is it possible to frame our modernity that way? And I think there are many ways we can speak about that, that we never got off slave ships, that we're still perpetuating this hierarchical kind of society that frames activism as inclusion versus exclusion. But there's so much more that we can do. Um, and that is why I feel the slave ship is recalling us to consider our circumstances. If we see it in the stark reality of that demonic or demonized figure, of that vessel, that carrack that sailed the Atlantic, then we might do some other kinds of work that does not reinforce the realm of the master. Now, Bio, I, I mentioned at the very beginning that I find you um, a very, very provocative, soul-stirring, mind-opening speaker, teacher. And I want to address that person who feels uncomfortable being bewildered, who feels uncomfortable mm -hmm. at the crossroads, who's, yeah. you know, okay, uh, stable, found, coherent. I don't feel like any of those things are happening right now. And yeah. I'm uncomfortable. I can't quite locate where we are in our evolutionary trajectory, where I am, bio's asking me all these questions, telling me these mythic stories. It feels very dreamy. I'm uncomfortable being bewildered. What's your response to that? Oh, that's where the work is. <laughs> that's where the work begins. Um, I would sit, this is, uh, and this might be something to mention that I, I was trained as a clinical psychologist and I, us I usually say I'm recovering from my profession. Um, I'm, rec I'm a recovering psychologist, but part of my recovery was sitting with Yoruba healers, you know, and learning their underground tactics for approaching people who were um, disturbed or uncomfortable. And what they would do didn't sound, you know, it didn't feel like the right thing to do, especially for me, who was trained almost entirely in Western traditions and Western sensitivities. I would find these men and they would basically poke holes, you know, they would injure uh, their clients. It's like, you're making matters worse. And I didn't understand that. And the idea here of feeling uncomfortable, you know, is that's where the work begins. That's where you're met. Because if you're so coherent, but, I mean, let me, let me put it this way. We have thrived in the myth that we, are, that we should be comfortable. It's our right to be comfortable, right? That um, uh, if I click a button, the button should yield the results that I, that I want. Um, it should give me that which I seek. And when I um, call upon a manager, I should be answered. So we live in this matrix, uh, this matrix of rights and privileges. 
uh, and we demand to be answered. And those things are good. Right? I've, been a ben I've been a beneficiary of, of that. But they also have other effects that are quite untoward because they can incarcerate us in a way of being that is very difficult to leave behind. So that the very first gift of the modern human is to make us uncomfortable. So if people find that they are politically homeless right now, if people find that they have more questions than answers, if people are finding that they have more uh, concerns than convictions at this moment in time, then I would say that the work has begun with you, probably. Um, and then maybe the next step is to ordain that recognition, is to find the others, is to learn how to listen, depending on where you are. The invitation is probably always to listen to bend our ears down, to embark on different forms of inquiry that does not reinforce the stable, luxurious positions we've occupied for hundreds of years as citizens gestating in this modern experiment. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough. I feel the edge work of our time is not to gain a sense of justice, is not to arrive at, a, at a, a utopian universe. Those are all fantasies of modern minds. It's to lose our way, which is the reason why my elders would say, if you want to find your way, you must become lost. It's to lose our sense of placement. Only then, and that's where the work begins, only then will we learn how to be wiser beings, wiser creatures, only in building wilder coalitions, you know, with the modern human around us. And there are ways this can happen that I'm not, of course, getting into, um, that, is, that requires probably months of studying together. Mm -hmm. I, I want to make uh, or ask you to make the connection between being lost and finding sanctuary, making sanctuary. Because I think part of what's so attractive when you just hear that, let us make sanctuary, is there's this feeling of, yes, I want to land. I want to be found. I want to feel connected in my body to the earth. I want to feel good about being a different kind of maybe supremely excessive human being, not the kind yeah. of human you were describing in some strange yeah. box, but a different kind of truly human kind. human. I want that. I want that sense of sanctuary. And yet I have to be lost to get there. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let, me see, let me see if I could break that down. Um, so I'm a citizen. I'm a citizen of very of a of people who are are tired. Let me put it that way. People who are really tired of all the promises of development, all the promises of um, the IMF, uh, of the World Bank. For I I mean this is where I grew up. I grew up in the so-called. I'm still I still am in the so-called global south. And the imperatives of people in this part of the world, in this hemisphere, is to catch up with you guys, you know, is to catch up with the West, is to catch up, is to look more like New York and London, um, which is a pity because New York and London is doing, is, you're doing their darndest to recover from all the losses that climate change has brought, you know, that, I mean, I think the world is now learning that um, maybe the ways that we have framed our lives and society isn't quite working in a good way right now. Um, so it's still a pity that we're exhausted and we don't even know where to go. Now, I say this because I grew up in, a, in Nigeria most of the time. We traveled a lot, but I grew up in Nigeria and I would learn about activism and the solutions that the West is bringing into our country. And most of these solutions only tended, they tended to reinforce the problems that we're trying to deal with. So we're caught up in, a cycle, in some kind of toxic cy uh, cyclical loop. We're always receiving from the West to solve our problems, which generated more problems, and then we're just stuck in this cycle. What do we do to break that cycle, Tammy? I think we get lost, and that's what getting lost means. And, and, it, and it, could, it could boil down to the very ways we conduct research. And let me speak like a, an academic, that even in the university, because that was, that's my profession, teaching in university, um, the ways we conduct research are, uh, tend to reinforce what we already know. 
what our colonial masters taught to us. Research is not about investigating new things. It's about confirming old ones, you know, right down to statistics, which famously was actually invented, um, or at least a part of statistics uh, by Sir Francis Galton, uh, Pearson product moment, was actually invented to rationalize white supremacy. You know, these are things we take for granted today and have been imported to Africa, to Asia, saying this is research, this is how to know things, this is how to be a university. And then people take these things on and they perpetuate the familiar. So what do we do when we need to break out of the familiar? We make sanctuary. This is what I think. This is my humble, modest offering, that there are ways of conducting research, there are ways of going on inquiry, there are ways of asking uh, or speaking with ancestors that is about being in that place of lostness. And it might sound very dangerous to people who are hearing about this, now, being lost, now, I don't want to be that. I want to be comfortable, right? But it actually is the lostness of a seed buried in the ground. It doesn't lose anything. It actually gains a forest. You know, it's the lostness of a child in a womb. It doesn't lose light. It becomes a human being. You know, it becomes a being that can experience other things. This is a place of growth. This is a place of becoming wilder. And I'm saying that we have become so incarcerated, so stuck in familiar patterns of doing things, of engaging, even with our activisms, that we need a break. And I mean that in all the senses of the word, we need a break. We need a break in our legs. We need to stop walking so fast. We need a break in the business as usual. And this will come in different ways, but it always comes with a break, sister. So that if you're not uncomfortable, you're probably not there. You know, I've heard you use this phrase post-activism, and I'd yeah. love to know more what you mean by that. I mean, um, activism is no less material than the table that my laptop is sitting on right now. Um, it is not just ideational. It is not just ideological. It's not just a social construct. It is material as well. Or shall I say, it is material discursive. It's body-mind. We tend to get into familiar patterns of activism that get stuck, like I just said. And when that happens, um, well, you want to be able to notice that, you know, the first thing. You want to be able to notice that, call that into attention, and do some other kind of work that might open, proliferate other possibilities. To break it down a little bit, climate justice. Our activisms have been at work, and I'm not trying to dismantle or dis disparage all the good work that people are doing everywhere, calling um, truth, uh, naming uh, all the failures of the industrial West or all the companies that are poisoning our lands and our estuaries and our rivers and stuff like that. Yes, we need to do that. But beyond these sites of contestation, what other things can we do? I mean, when we lose hope, what are the resources we have then? When we get to the end of our ropes, what other resources do we have? That is the question of post-activism. But at the heart of this idea of post-activism is the idea that the way we respond to the crisis is part of the crisis. That is, even in preferring solutions to our deepest, most challenging problems, we tend to repeat those problems. Um, for instance, and I think I, I, I read this recently, and I don't know if we've discussed this before in one of our informal um, talks together, um, that this, there was this, uh, I think it's Con Oil or something like that, Conoco or something, uh, an oil drilling company in Texas, headquartered in Texas. And um, what they're trying to do at the moment is to chill the ground, is to stabilize the ground because of the permafrost is melting. Um, so they're trying to stabilize the ground in order to put a stop on climate loss and climate change. Right. But what they're actually trying to do is to stabilize the ground so that oil drilling can continue. So you can see we're in this cyclical loop where solutions are only part of the metaphysics, the paradigm that gave birth to the problems in the first place. For instance, again, with a pandemic, we're trying to, our darndest to create a vaccine. 
no one is talking about the damages or the ecological costs of creating vaccines that will only put us back into that kind of deleterious master slave relationship with our environments that gave birth to the virus in the first place. Well, in a sense, because it's, it's our encroachment on new spaces that gave birth or disturbed the bacterial activisms in other species and that gave birth to the virus that, lured, uh, that led to zoonotic transfer. And now we have uh, the coronavirus pandemic. So it seems that we're in a cyclical toxic loop. And what we need are other kinds of activisms that are not so committed to the highway of justice as are committed to asking different kinds of questions that are probably not noticeable when we centralize ourselves and justices, you know, but are you know, at the edges of our activism. That's why I call it post-activism. It's not a way of saying this is the more sacred, more advanced form of activism. It's about saying that we need other questions right now. Now, one of the things uh, you mentioned uh, towards the end of your talk was the notion that grieving our grief could be a type of activist work. And yeah. that got my attention because I noticed, especially during the pandemic, that I've been processing a lot of grief and I've seen this in friends of mine as well. And yeah. it's hard to know if it's personal, collective, it's hard to know, but uh, something has happened during this time where it feels yeah. quite palpable and it's really a journey. And so I'd love to know more from you about uh, what you understand about how to process grief in, in a way that's beneficial, that actually could be a form of activism, question mark? Mm -hmm. Well, Tammy, grief in my world is in private. It's a public affair. One, because we don't even see ourselves as individualized selves, you see, that are containers for this private internal feeling that we think of as grief. Grief spills. Um, grief is ecological. So eco-psychologists would already agree to this, that it is not so much a private thing that we hold inwards, it's a murmuration. And I'm trying to evoke the, the waltzing of starlings in the sky, which is called a murmuration. It's a murmuration of bodies, both human and non-human. I have often thought of um, the opening of plants or the falling of leaves, you know, in, in the fall, you know, as a form of grieving. Uh, maybe that's how trees grieve. Um, maybe the world grieves in ways that we do not know how to name yet. But maybe grief is happening all around us. Maybe we need grief. Maybe we're always occupying. Maybe we're actually citizens of grief all the time. You know, um, Modernity would have us believe that, believe that grief is a thing apart, you know, an isolated feeling, often pathological. Our job is to stamp it out and as a shrink, shrink it away, get people back into productive cycles of the business as usual, and then people can be more, can be better citizens. But I feel if we stamp out grief, we stamp out a part of ourselves, we stamp out conditions that make us possible, right? So grief is onto epistemological grief is ethical grief is ethological grief is spiritual grief is societal grief is social um, and we cannot push it away so if we recognize grief as ecological as a terrain you know that is existing at the liminal tense edges between the human the colonial human and the human that is yet to come or the fugitive spaces that we might yet occupy if we see grief as part of the, the materials of that liminal space, what would it be like to actually pay attention to it, to actually explore it as a cartographical project, as a map making project of finding, locating loss. Now, the way this might play out is, I don't imagine people coming together to just, you know, grief comes from a place of loss, right? That's how we experience it. Um, I don't, I don't, 
I don't imagine people coming together to just cry together, you know, and that's grief. I don't imagine it as a, uh, an isolated Western styled uh, talk therapeutic thing. That is about making us feel better. I actually think about it as, um, as something political, as politics, grief as politics. I think of it as activism, like I've said, that maybe there are ways for people to come together Maybe we can actually direct and sponsor and support people who come together to explore loss as a way of responding to our times. You know, we actually frame justice as the end goal of all our activisms, most of our activisms at least, um, if not all of them. But what if grief is also an outcome? What if staying in that place does the work of reshaping our sensibilities so that we can taste different, see different, think different, embrace each other different. Maybe there's wisdom in staying in that terrain. So people come together, people have uh, research topics, people have ways of embarking on archival projects, people have ways of ritualizing their space together. There's something improvisational about this and there's always something ancestral about this. But I feel that we should be inventing spaces of grief as activism where we can embark on fugitive expeditions beyond the human. So, Bio, you identify with this word fugitive. You're a fugitive. You identify with that. That makes sense to you to say, I'm a fugitive. I'm, I'm always uh, shy, just reticent about, you know, um, saying I am this, <laughs> you know, like, um, um, in a sense, I'm not, because, uh, well, we can only be, we only show up in part. None of us shows up completely. We show up in part. That's the, that's what an entangled world um, demands. You only show up in part. Um, but to an extent, I would answer in the affirmative. I left the university system. I ran away from the schooling, the, the idea of schooling as the exclusive way of thinking about education. Um, even though I teach in many universities around the world today, um, I still consider myself not part of that system, not entirely tethered to it, that I cannot dismantle myself from it. But in a truer sense, I would say I'm a fugitive because of the ways we're meeting our children, my wife and I. Um, I think we're the only ones that I know around these parts that are not sending our children to school. Um, and schooling is a huge thing in India. It's almost like unquestioned wisdom. Um, and it's ideological. It's part of the nation state's apparatus for configuring its own growth, its own march towards supremacy, towards um, uh, superpoweredness, you know, super nation status. And I feel, and my wife and I felt, we don't want our children to be part of this. What if we met them in their spaces? What if we conducted research with our children? What if we treated them as elders according to our own traditions? You know, and what if we said to ourselves that learning happens everywhere? And this is not to demonize those or to pathologize those or to make those who are sending their children to schools feel less than. No, it's a way of saying wisdom is always contextual. And I think our fugitive work comes from this place of being with our kids in awkward ways. So, you know, Bio, what I'm noticing is there's a whole heck of a lot uh, that I could talk to you about and that I long to talk to you about, and I hope and trust we'll have future opportunities. To end our conversation, I wanna pick up on one thing that you said that opened a large space for me, which was talking about our excessiveness. Yeah. Starting, and it, what it opened for me was I touched into times, maybe they've been times in uh, deep, stillness or meditation, sense of really kind of melting into space, where I could feel that sense of spilling into everythingness mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. excessive, beyond excessive, you know, unbounded. And I, I wanted to understand from you what that excessiveness feels like when you touch into it, like what it actually feels like and how you think it could inform us in different ways, how it changes us. Mm. I'm learning about this, Tammy, from my own children, especially my daughter. My daughter would hold up 
something like this remote control and say it's a dragon, right? There's something improvisational, playful about that. The way children meet the world, they don't meet a world of already made things. They seem to perform a relational universe, like a world of relationships that often congeals into things, but those things are never stable. So that it's also true that this remote control is a dragon. And this remote, and this doll here, which is given to me by a Filipino professor, is a spirit. Who is to say that it's not? Modern empiricism? Modern empiricism is political. It's culturally closed. It's just one way out of the manifold. So when my child says, Dada, let's play spaceship, and she gets into that carton box right there, just in front of me, um, there's something quite liberating about that. It means that carton box is also a spaceship. That is the idea of excessiveness, the embarrassing excessiveness of things that allows me to say, for instance, that a slave ship is also a site of decolonial power. It's also a site of emancipatory politics. It's also a site of collective therapy. It's also a site of the modern human otherwise that lies at the edges of the colonial order that we're trying to dismantle. It's also a way of responding to white normativity. You might say, whoa, that feels like a lot, but dwell with me for a moment. Um, if you read about how those incarcerated black bodies actually responded to their white oppressors, you might find that theory of excess, that theory of play right there with them. There's a story about plantations in Cuba, for instance, and in Brazil, where um, the Spaniards and, and the Portuguese and, uh, would take these bodies and put them in church and say, now your worship is directed to that white God right there, this bearded Gandalf fellow. You know, that's what you should be worshiping. Um, those slaves insisting on remembering the worlds that they came from um, decided to cloak their own spirits, their own gods and tricksters and all of that. They cloaked them and hid them, you know, in the philosophies and in the rituals of their white masters. So they took Peter's name and they hid uh, the god of Ion, the Yoruba god of Ion, Ogun, there. They took Paul's name and they hid Eshu. So that when they came in public and they said, oh, we worship Peter, we worship Paul, they were actually, you know, it was a secret code, which is also how the Negro spirituals came to be. It was a codified way of speaking, a hidden fugitive way of speaking that said to themselves that we're actually dismantling power. We're not responding to our white oppressors by taking them head on. You know, we've tried that before. Maybe that didn't quite work, but we can build worlds under their noses. We can build spiritual systems under their noses. And the religion of Santeria, and they came from that. Rastafarianism came from that. Gayap gift cultures came from that. All these, even uh, uh, capoeira, you know, the martial art of capoeira, the dance martial art of capoeira, came from this cloaking spiritualities, this way of fugitively masking what you're doing. Um, so this is the idea of excess that when we come to a place where power seems to defeat us, there is a way to frame engagement and responsibility and responsivity and ethical practice that is not in the power or in the epistemology of our oppression. That there is a way we can conduct our bodies together that hides and proliferates and germinates and fertilizes other worlds, other wisdoms. That's what I think it does to us. It shape shifts us. It defeats us, but it allows us to be aware, to be alive, to be attuned to everything around us. Well, I don't want to say everything. I don't want to absolutize it. But other wisdoms around us that are lurking, that are present, but are not accessible because we perform this human body. We perform this human uh, ritual so fastly, so um, seriously that we forget the others around us. So I think that's what it does. Bio, when I'm with you and I hear you speak, I, I feel the future. I don't know how else to really say it. I feel the future here. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for being part of Sounds True's Walking Together 
world. Thank you for your work. For those who are interested, Bio will be leading an intensive three-month course. It's called We Will Dance with Mountains, Let Us Make Sanctuary. Meanwhile, uh, a deep bow to you, Bio. Being entangled with you is a joy. Thank you. Thank you, my dear friend and sister. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Insights at the Edge. You can read a full transcript of today's interview at resources.soundstrue.com backslash podcast. That's resources.soundstrue.com slash podcast. If you're interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And if you feel inspired, head to iTunes and leave Insights at the Edge a review. I absolutely love getting your feedback and being connected. Sounds true. Waking up the world.